Music is your own experience, your thoughts and wisdom. If you don't live it, then don't come out of your horn. There are, there are a lot of layers to that quote. Uh, one of the things that strikes me right away is uh, there are debates in music performance and interpretation about how should you perform. Should you perform as though the music comes through you and you are a vessel for the music, almost an objective, impartial interpreter? Uh, so that if you're playing a piece by Beethoven, for example, you're supposed to play the way Beethoven would have wanted it played, if he could play as his spirit through you. Or are you someone who analyzes the music, lives the music, and then when you perform it, it's you performing the music, uh, and it's clear that the piece is by Beethoven, but you're just another author in the process of the music being born in the hands of its creator and then traveling through an interpreter who, in, who incorporates just as much into the music, into the authorial process, and then finally when that music reaches an audience. So in other words, are you objective as though you have nothing to do with it, you're just letting the music flow through your fingers or voice, or are you just as an active, as active a creator in the process as the initial composer was. And uh, that's the big debate, I think. I don't think there are any answers to this. It's not one yes and the other one no, or vice versa. I think it really depends on how strong of, of a personality you have as an artist to begin with. And some people are terrific technicians. They can use their hands to play pretty much anything, or their voice to sing pretty much anything. And the result is they do a very good job at sort of creating an object. And then on the other hand, you've got people who are, who are so dominant in their own personalities that they take over. And when you hear, well, I'll give you an example. You hear Glenn Gould perform anything, and uh, it's Glenn Gould first, and then the composer second. So he, him playing Bach is Gould Bach. You hear more contemporary performers because I think the school of thought has shifted on how you should play. And sometimes you get that performer last. And, and there's a lot of criticism in music that speaks to that, that you should be playing as though you're uh, objectifying it to such an extent that you're just a mere vessel and not a personality that's part of the performance. Uh, you kind of have to put yourself back, um, diminish your role as much as possible, which to me personally is uh, a strange uh, way of thinking about it. I've always thought that the personality of the performer comes first, and you do your best. Uh, you experiment. He, here's what he says. If you don't live it, it don't come out of your horn. And that, to me, is basically him saying, um, if you can't make it your own, don't even bother. And uh, th I agree with that. I think, though, we have many performers, especially in the classical side of things, where they're not composers themselves, they play it as though they're trying to diminish their own responsibility. And the result is maybe technically perfect performances, but thoroughly uninteresting, you know, soulless, because the soul of the composer is dead, depending on what you think of souls. But let's just say the composer is dead, if you're playing something by uh, Beethoven, as an example. But you're not. On a purely technical level, playing what's, as he says, not there, is actually the space between the notes. Because what rhythm really is, because music is fundamentally about rhythm, not pitch, not register, it's fundamentally about movement. So what's in between two events, if you go bam, ba, ba, 
there are three things that I just sang, but uh, but there's actually air in between all of those notes. And that air is that timing when you flow from one event to the, to the next, and that's playing what's not there. So what I just sang, that rhythm can be interpreted in so many different ways. Ta-ta-ta, or ta-ta-ta, or ta-ta-ta, ta-ta-ta, right? Slight differences in the timing between all three events, and it creates a completely different performance. One could be danceable, the other one could be suddenly very grave and serious and appropriate for a dirge, and the other one is a, is a ballroom scene. If, if I'm remembering the quote more, more precisely, music is incapable of expressing anything. What did he mean? He meant that music should not be read into uh, the way that it has been for centuries, that sort of modern take that music represents so many different emotions and states. Uh, going back to the 17th century with uh, music expressing affective states of emotion and there being formulae in music that can do so. That thought has continued all the way into the present. If you just take, uh, <laughs> if you listen to Ray Charles sing Hit the Road Jack, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about because you're hearing that descending bass line from the very start repeat throughout the entire piece. Dom, bom, 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 and over, over, over and over again. And it, that same descending four note pattern goes back to the 17th century and it was then just like now meant to convey sadness and something a little bit gloomy there's a melancholy to it so it's no accident that music does mean something Mozart is sunshine Mozart's music gives us permission to live from Mozart I learned to say important things in a conversational way it's an it's an awe to Mozart, not as a human being, but as an icon. As uh, what I say sometimes to my students as well, as well as in my concerts is, what we need to remember is to humanize these artists. That Mozart had as many foibles and problems and eccentricities as any one of us, perhaps even more so. And uh, we, we need to move away from that constant adoration of the likes of Mozart as though he were a museum bust. You know, we're just seeing him from here up with no arms, no legs, with a statuesque face made out of marble. Somebody has to speak up and say, I don't like Mozart. I think he wrote bad piano music. And just, just I'm not saying that I think that, because I, I don't know what's going to happen if I say it on camera. I might get attacked by, you know, Mozart mobs. But... Uh, but you know who did say that, by the way, and was a great artist in his own right, and I mentioned him earlier, Glenn Gould. Glenn Gould, again, talking about ironic stances, he recorded all of Mozart's piano sonatas, but he did them in such an unconventional, interpretive way that the critics were all over that recording, that album, saying, you took tempi that were way too fast, some tempos were extraordinarily slow and outside of the pocket of, I, I guess, convention. And someone has to come along and say, listen, what, what is convention? Bach became the Bach that we know now because of the Italians. Uh, the, the, the concise thematic treatment that you hear in most of the music that people know by Bach, he learned from other sources. In other words, he stole. Right? And, that's, and, and that's precisely, precisely what Casals is talking about, the greatest composers. Because it's a question of character and courage. If you're not, if you're afraid, and it's funny because yesterday I was looking at a video, again on YouTube, the, <laughs> the cultural definition of what we are now, um, about body language. So if you're courageous, you have open body language. It's, it's uh, something that was very interesting as part of this uh, talk that I was listening to, was that people who have never experienced, uh, let's say, the, the, the point was, when you win a race, if you see a marathon runner or a, or a, or a sprinter win a race, what's the, what do they do as they come toward or across the finish line? Lift up their arms. That's right. They make their body as big as possible. They lift up their arms in celebration. Turns out that blind people who have never seen this, obviously, when they are in similar circumstances, they do exactly the same thing. So, and, th and there is lots of evidence in the animal kingdom that animals do exactly that. They make themselves bigger, right, to dominate. And, and the opposite is also true. You see people all the time who, when they're worried or they're nervous, they want to take up as little space as possible. They, they 
put their hands together. They, they try to occupy less space. They crunch down instead of opening up and spreading out. The reason I'm talking about this is because it's a similar personality of courageousness that can steal, right? And I don't mean that, again, in a negative sense. I'm not saying pass off someone else's work as your own. I mean borrow, maybe that's the better word here. Borrow in order to create a synthesis of styles, right? You've learned something from a hundred different composers. You're not going to sound like any one of them. You're going to sound like a synthesis of so many variables. And there's a cour courageousness to doing that. Because someone who is not courageous and someone who is maybe a little bit ignorant about what art entails will say, I don't want to hear anyone else's opinion. I'm going to do this all on my own. I'm tired before the concert. Uh, yeah, if you're a very nervous person, your nerves tire you out. And just before the concert, you don't want to do it. And this reminds me of another quote by, by Pavarotti, the opera singer. He would say that, uh, something very similar. He would say, every time uh, he, I'm, I'm going to speak from his voice. Every time I'm about to go on stage to perform, I always say, why do I do this? I hate this. This is the worst thing ever, that moment of anticipation, of nervousness. And then after the show, he says, I could never live without this. But I have that same feeling. Before a concert, the day of is the worst. Because you're just waiting for that. If the show starts at 7 o'clock, you're just waiting for 7 o'clock to roll around. And it goes so slowly. And then the concert itself is usually, if it's a good concert, I remember very little, because it's just a blur. Um, and then afterwards, you're on that high. Until the next one. Do you practice the day of the concert? Uh... That's something that I've still been trying to figure out uh, 20 years into my career. I would say I, well, definitely do is warm up. And I'll maybe play slowly. Whatever repertoire I'm about to play, I'll play it very slowly. Uh, will I full on practice the way I would the day or two before? No. Because what you're really trying to do, so what are you practicing for, right? I, I'll ask my students and myself the same question. What are you practicing for? Are you practicing so that in your head you know that you can get all the notes? In that case, practice away. But what's going to happen is if you practice full on the day of the performance, you won't have much energy left for the performance itself. And you'll treat the performance like just another practice session. But it's not a practice session. It can't be. For, for one thing, you've, you've got nerves. You've got the anxiety. You've got the fight or flight mechanism fighting within you. And there's an audience. Uh, you want to communicate something that's special during a performance, something that can't be replicated uh, any, any other time. And so you need to have freshness, you need to have energy. So Would practicing the day of is really, it's, it's wrong-headed. Because you're not, however unprepared you may feel, one more session isn't going to do anything. There, there have been some people who have critically come up to me and said things like, did you try the piano before the performance? Because you really should have, something like that. Uh, you need to know your space. You need to know what the piano sounds like. And I'll say, yeah, that's true. I didn't have the opportunity to try the piano because it was impossible. Um, sometimes people say, you know, I really like the second piece in the program, but I hated your Bach. I've heard that. The only way to respond, because you're not going to start a philosophical conversation where there are other people who want to talk to you, uh, is to, I laugh usually, I say, well, listen, thank you for your thoughts. I have no problem at this stage receiving criticism. I'm only happy uh, to, to get it because I know that that means I have an opportunity to grow from that comment. But if someone just says, well, I just didn't like it, that, that to me is a non-explanation. So if that's the kind of person you're dealing with, then it's, you can't take that person seriously. But if someone has good intentions and just doesn't want to be, I mean, there are people in the audience who are assholes, you know, they want to come up to you and they just want to say something mean and they want to, they, they want to be disheartening and they want to be deconstructive and destructive. And if they are, then so that's their problem. So be it. But if someone really has good intentions, constructive intentions, and says, you know, I'm a musician myself, or I'm an artist myself, and I felt that there was something missing, uh, there was some bigger picture. That uh, Do you know, for example, that Bach at that time was suffering through XYZ? Or did you know that he was elated because of the following circumstances? In which case, then you can talk. And, and it doesn't come across as a criticism. It, com it comes across as two people who want to share something. And that's another performance right there. All music is folk music. I ain't ever heard a horse sing a song. 
<laughs> That's Louis Armstrong. Uh, well, unless you're reading Gulliver's Travels, where in the last world he visits the, uh, the horse world where, um, see, this is also very memorable to me because Swift came up with, uh, you know, the author Swift, he came up with a great name for these horse people, the Hunims. It sounds like you're neighing as you say it, Hunims. And uh, that was a whole culture where the horses were on top and the most sophisticated creatures and uh, people were no better than slugs. They were like cave dwellers and just barely out of the mud. Music hurts so deeply that it is not hurt at all, but you are the music while the music lasts. Uh, only a poet could write something with so much difficulty to, <laughs> to discern. What I get from this quote is that some pieces of music, like Stravinsky wrote, too many pieces of music finish long after the end. If we took that quote, the Stravinsky quote, honestly, and applied the same thinking to T.S. Eliot, I would say that what Eliot is thinking of is that some pieces resonate so deeply through our culture. Joel, kind of what you said about Mozart, that we can enjoy it for the music's sake, even if it's 250 years later, 230 years later, um, almost. Uh, because they are part of our cultural DNA. We just hear it, we know it. And as you're listening to it, that's the second part of this quotation, you are the music while the music lasts. That you disassociate the music from the composer. That's not about Mozart as you're listening to it. It becomes an extension of your own feelings and thoughts. And you live your life in that moment through the music.